Hello everyone, this is Brother Byron coming at you with another podcast video, uh, this time over marriage. Uh, I just want to touch up on some things. I'm terribly sorry. It's been a long time since I've made one of these podcast videos. Rock Tower uh, is one of the joys of my life that I have to work on, and um, I want to continue to make more videos in the future. I have many more ideas, and uh, I'm so, I'm so happy that the, uh, my French, vi uh, podcast vids are just as successful as my English ones on here, but uh, I want to continue to share scripture and share, uh, appropriate doctrine and to evangelize on this podcast and been trying to look for a career change. Uh, we just had our daughter born, uh, uh, literally almost three months ago Two to, in two days, little Sophie will be three months old. Uh, me and my wife just celebrated our second wedding anniversary, and I love my wife so much. She's so beautiful and such a a part of my life that I can't imagine going without with. And and it's just sort of inspired me to do this video because um, uh, it seems like today, I, I know I'm sort of jumping into action here, but I'll just go ahead. But uh, it seems like today a lot of people are confused about marriage. A lot of people are confused about what good marriage is. Uh, you see all kinds of books and literature and movies and self-help videos, both both uh, religious and secular likewise, talk about this. Um, and yet half of all marriages in America end in divorce, which I think is pretty sad because uh, 50 years ago you never would have heard this. It, uh I think our grandparents and great grandparents would be shocked to see how we've we've wounded and tarnished this institution, this this covenant from God. But I'll go into what marriage is uh, anyway to levy out that complication. But um, the main reason I made this video is because I have personally done two weddings. They were wonderful weddings. Um, they were both beautiful. Uh, really, me and my wife enjoy going to weddings. Uh, and I know we're young right now and a lot of our friends are getting married and are seeing people and enjoying that other person and going on a life with them. But we have to hone in and understand what God understands about marriage and what he feels marriage should be between a man and a woman. But I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, this video might be longer than anticipated because this is a vast topic. Not only is it scriptural and philosophical, but it's also sociological in and of, its, of itself. And we have a lot of minute issues to discuss in this video. So I want to hammer that out and just go on with it. So... Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for marriage. I thank you for the for its holiness, for its covenantal nature. I thank you for allowing man and woman to bind together into oneness and grow closer to you, your holy trinity in every way that we see fit. King of kings and Lord of lords, I just thank you for all that you've done, all the blessings that you give, for your tender mercy and compassion that you give to us. Lord, Lord Jesus, I pray that marriage would be taken more seriously in the 2020s and beyond in the future, that it would go back to its, its coaptability, its mutability, its permanence, Lord, that it would go back to its permanent value, Lord, that it would go back to its heterosexual spiritual roots and grow stronger and ever more fervent and in your holy scripture and in your foundation, Lord, that you built from the foundation of the world when you made man and woman in your own image. And I thank you so much for that. We, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, though his blood was shed on Calvary's cross, have life eternity to you, Father. I pray for our husbands, our Christian husbands out there. May they love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave themselves for them. I pray for our wives, uh, our mothers, Lord, as well as our fathers, Lord. I pray that they would love their husbands and submit to them as as house as house keeps, Lord, and as helpmates and as helpers in the home, Father God, as we see in Scripture, Lord. I pray that this this foundation, Lord, wouldn't be misogynistic or degrading, Father God, but it would be that it would be unifying, Lord, that it would be 
it would enhance both the genders in marriage, Father God. It would strengthen new bonds of fellowship, not only with husband and wife, Lord, as well, but with with you as well, Father God. Lord, I pray for those who are experiencing marital problems right now, Father God, who are experiencing difficulties, whether it be financial, whether it be familial, whether it be sexual, no matter what that need is, Father God, you know what that need is. It is, excuse me, and I pray that you will heal this need as you see fit, Father God, and that you would do well with that. Lord, I thank you for, for marriage. I thank you for my salvation. Lord, I thank you for my wife and my family. Lord, be with me as a husband that I need to be, Father God, in the way I should go. I ask all this and forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So let's bounce into it. Like I said before, uh, this podcast will go over... First of all, I want to go over the theological foundation of marriage, its background, how it uh, it evolved from its judastic roots. I want to explain and define husbandry and wifehood. And also, uniquely to this video, I want to talk about uh, civic marriage over spiritual marriage. I want to talk about why it may even be considered a third ordinance of the church, even though it's not explicitly taught that way. I want to explain what good, healthy spiritual marriage is, what valid and invalid marriage is, and what marriage should be in all its reasonable sense in of itself. So let's make let's let's give a ballpark definition right quick. Okay, according to scripture, from Genesis all the way through New Testament principle. Marriage as intended to be and it has evolved today is a divine covenant and perhaps an ordinance, ordinational relationship established by God, spiritually solemnizing and uniting a man and a woman in a state of oneness that is committed and loved into for life. This ordinance in its covenantal nature is sacred, permanent, has co-optal mutability, it is full of intimate love and exclusive to the monogam monogamity excuse me, of the man and woman within the union itself. It is a private, daily, lifelong covenant that must be taken seriously, both the man and the woman, as they flourish and enjoin within holy matrimony as they get closer to God. Now, I know that was a mouthful, but basically that it's, it's sort of self-explanatory is what it is. Now, a husband... Is uh, I, I want to rewind a minute and discuss other and and uh, go over what I want to discuss as well too. I want to talk about intersex relationships and marriage and how the Christian community and the Baptistic community sees that. I want to go over that in a little bit, and I also want to go over other aspects of marriage too. And I'll get into that. I just I don't have it on top of my head from reading from the script. But anyway, a husband is a biological male that is the leader protector, provider, and spiritual head of, of the household and family itself. He is responsible for loving, caring for his wife at all times as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The wife is a biological female who is the child bearer, co-carer, helpmate, co-lover, co-nurturer, and co-servant with him in the home. Both spouses have co-equal responsibility and share co-equal worth to God. The husband does have the last say in decisions, but he is duty-bound to be as transparent and free with his wife as he ought to be, and the wife also has say in marital and childbearing decisions as well, such as property, custody, and other issues. The husband's headship is defined in Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13-15. Though this defined gender roles in church settings, it also has a marital connotation to it as well. Why do we get married? You may ask. What well, What's the purpose of marriage? Why Why do we? You know, why did I I seek out a wife in my young adult life? Why do Why do men seek out women? Why do women seek out men? Why Why do we do this? Why did God institute this in the first place? These are all excellent questions. The reason why marriage has been established and its purpose is for companionship. Of man and woman, it is. Genesis told us it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. He needed to help me. You know, he he couldn't do what he could do with a giraffe or an elephant or another animal of the field. He had to have another human being. He had to have a different type of human being. It, it couldn't have been a man. It had to be a woman in that aspect. Some something different as well as similar to Adam itself in that aspect. But anyway. Marriage is also for the spiritual edification of husband and wife in their spiritual walks. It is also for sexual purity and procreation. The goal is that in these 
these monogamous spiritual relationships that God has instituted, that God would allow human beings to be procreated in an appropriate fashion, and that it would cut down off of any sexual illnesses or sexual maladies that impact the human race. Now, that is not to say that a, a married couple who does it right couldn't have sexual impurity and they couldn't procreate, but we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, the Holy Trinity blesses these unions by believing by the believing man and woman by sanctifying their marriage actively and passively in his righteousness. Now, going on forward, I want to discuss another thing. Now, many, uh, excuse me, other Christians outside of Protestant life, outside of Reform life, will tell you that marriage is a sacrament. Now, I want to also assure you that we do not believe in sacraments. We believe in ordinances. There is a difference. An ordinance is an out, outward display of faith, and it is shown through active and passive righteousness rather than actual imputation. I want to give an argument why marriage is not a sacrament through baptistic sense and through Scripture in and of itself. First of all, as I've already said, the word sacrament is not in the Bible, therefore there can be no theological allusion to it, and it is non-existent. God solemnizes and blesses the union ultimately. The pastor is just the human male vessel that God chooses to use and bring the couple together. As I've already said before also, marriage is an outward expression of faith in and of itself. When the couple vow for that covenant, they are showing off their faith and their zeal that God has in their lives inwardly that the couple ought and should have for the love of each other in their lives as well as the Lord's counsel and wisdom in their marriage if they sought counseling, which they should. Grace is already in their hearts and has already been pre-imputed prior to the vowing of the union if they both know Christ. There is no imputation of grace specifically for marriage in and of itself and it is only this is only accomplished in the salvific acceptance of man and woman who follow follow Christ prior to them getting married. This explains why death or glorification of the man and woman should they die frees that person from the marital union in and of itself. This sense of non-imputation of grace also further explains why adultery or desertion also allows divorce to be permissible only on those conditions. Only God can spiritually dissolve a union and there is no scripture giving a pastor or deacon the ability to carry out a spiritual divorce. Now, I understand other churches, like Episcopalians or whatever, have divorce decrees or whatever like that, but these are just baloney certificates that have no meaning in it whatsoever, in of itself. I also want to give an argument why marriage may even be considered an ordinance. And you're saying, well, Brother Byron, we only have Lord's Supper and baptism. I understand that. However, uh, the early church fathers, like Thomas Knowles and John Gill, thought about it as an ordinance, and they defended that in their early works and used scripture to defend it of itself. And here's my argument for that. At its core, marriage is sacred, and it is an institution given by God, and it is to be protected, and is already actively protected by New Testament Christians. You have Christians, even as I'm speaking the words out of my mouth, who are trying to protect spiritual marriage, they don't believe in anything outside of spiritual marriage. If, if there's no covenant, there's no marriage, plain and simple. And because of that covenantal nature that solidifies the ordinance of marriage in and of itself and gives God the, the heart and the reason for marriage in that aspect going on. Marriage is symbolic and points to Christ in the solemnization of grace actively and passively. I've done explain that. These symbols are purity and the... Si and sin ending as wife and husband unite as one. It also symbolizes the perfection of the Trinity. It symbolizes sacrifice as both husband and wife will sacrifice for each other as Christ sacrificed all at Calvary. It represents new life as the couple starts anew, just as in salvation. You're a new creature. You're a new. You're a new being. You know when you accept Jesus, His grace allows new life to begin and to sanctify going forward. Although a marriage is highly significant, it is not a means of salvation as grace is active and passive 
and it is not regener regenerative in the marriage union. This explains why it is not a sacrament explained before. It correlates heavily to other doctrines of grace, non salifically such as soul competency, priesthood of all believers, and other Baptistic teachings. So I would argue because it's protected, it has symbolic gesture of Christ of his death, burial, and resurrection because the couple dies to each other. They sacrifice to each other. They raise to walk in a newness of life when they recommit to each other in of itself, and they bury themselves in their lives. They die to each other as Christ did. And you say, all right, Brother Byron, give an example of that. All right, look at the wedding of Cana. All right, Christ could have performed the marriage ceremony, but he didn't. He blessed the the ceremony as well. And when he turned the water into wine at Caden, he's, the old life had passed away, new life had become new, and he blessed it and sanctified that through that. Also, whenever the Old Testament Jews married pagan people, that that their, the pagan peoples of Palestine, of Palestine of the Middle East did not believe in a covenantal nature of marriage. They only believe in the carnal nature of marriage. So that that marriage was improper, and it had no means of grace through this. Even though the Jews didn't believe in Jesus, that same element of grace still existed and carried on through that. So a lot of you may ask, well, did marriage fall out of the sky, or how did all this come to be, so to speak? Well, in a nutshell, this is how it all happened. Okay, before the modern Baptistic church in, in Holland, and before Helvis and Smith came into the foothold in, in Holland and in England and they were married too and they got married the same way we do today in the covenantal nature of it. Uh, Jewish custom was highly prolific in marriages from 380 onwards towards the Reformation. But we need to explain why marriage evolved the way it did and why it was God's will for marriage to be the way it was and established firmly by the 17th century. Jewish custom stipulated that there was a betrothal or engagement process, which usually took place around a year's time similar to modern unions. What is unique is that a male relative could propose a marriage in lieu of the husband's absence. Marriage had to have an appropriate agency and consent to be valid, and two unrelated male witnesses must see the post-engagement ceremony or the actual wedding ceremony. Only after the marriage was consecrated could cohabitation be allowed and the couple could then live together. And a ring was the most common wedding item at that time, but it could also be a family heirloom, a trousseau, or something like that, or a dowry from the wife that she exchanged with the husband. You know, it, it, it was just different back then because some people couldn't afford gold and silver back then. <laughs> I thought this was. I thought I'd share this on this podcast. But uh, uh, if uh, let's say I was married in in Christ's time in in early uh, Judea, or whatever, this is what I'd have to provide for my wife. I'd have to provide enough bread to last two meals a day, sufficient oil for cooking and for lighting purposes, sufficient wood for cooking, fruit and vegetables. Wine, if it was customary for women to drink it in the locale. Three meals on each Sabbath consisting of fish and meat. An allowance of silver coin. I'd, ha I'd also had to provide conjugal, providement, and protection duties, which is kind of self-explanatory. It's what, pretty much what all husbands have done since the beginning of time as well. But let me be absolutely clear in this. Just because marriage followed a tomorrow Tomotic vesture and went in that direction does not mean that we follow the Talmud and there's no such thing as a Talmudic Christian. This explains why a Jew or Christian could not wed together. This also explains, and um, also there were a lot of things in the Old Testament that were not explicit in marriage, which is why the, the Romans and other governments had civic nature established with that in and of itself in that avenue. But we'll get more into that here in a minute. I will say this, however. Old Testament laws pertaining to sex and marriage are to be followed and respected. And after 300 AD, when non-Baptistic... Catholic teachings took over mainstream Christian thought and action. Most marriages were condoned without ministerial blessing, without witnesses, and they had huge non-covenantal focuses. This was bad. 
And often the, uh, these priests would have a sacramental document to let them know they got married. And marriage was just weird before 1610. I'll just put it that way. And it, and uh, I, I'm not trying to bash Catholicism hugely on my podcast. I don't do that. But we have to understand how that institution has tarnished doctrine, how they besmirched it, and how we can bring it more into the positive light, isn't it, even if, if we go forward into that. Uh, this is how you, uh, this is how you have a successful marriage. <laughs> if it was only that easy, I, me and my wife, I mean, it's a day to day thing. Let me tell you, um, like I said earlier, it's private daily lifelong commitment. Uh, but this is something that I've learned the past two years as a pastor counseling people or getting married as well as, uh, being married myself. This is what you need to do. Number one. Pray, sing, and worship to God on a daily basis. Read scripture together. Also, dance together. Write love letters to each other. Write correspondence to each other. Both husband and wife need to be willing to adapt and change their habits with each other. You need to pursue each other and love each other more deeply and more earnestly every day, just as you did when you were single with Christ. Pursue Christ together as you pursue each other together. Be down to earth and transparent over every issue, no matter how insignificant. Pick your love. Be passionate, be intimate, and commit to each other every day. Give each other everything you can in life. And I'm not just talking about material objects or money, but everything you have. Respect each other's separate interests and give each other's privacy. You don't have to spend every waking moment with your spouse as well. There are things and hobbies that my, my wife has that I don't have and vice versa. For example, um, as many of y'all know, I'm an avid Sega fan. I have been for a long time. My wife don't play the Sega, you know, two player with me all the time. And I'm all right with that. My wife has a TikTok account and I don't have a TikTok because I just don't really care for TikTok. I guess I'm getting older and social media sort of wearing down on me a little bit, but <laughs> it just, it, it is what it is. That Avenue, just let, let your spouse have their own time. I would even say, you know, be like Jesus. Go off and have some privacy one-on-one -on -one because you need that as well as togetherness. You need together time, but I feel like a married couple needs their own alone time with just them and Christ themselves to pursue each other's habits, but within reason, within acceptable limits. Uh, spend, spend time on each other's phones. Goof off on each other's phones. Uh, I think that's the number one reason why millennial couples have trouble. They get jealous over each other's cell phone. Uh information or whatever it is. And I mean, if there's closet pornography or closet secrets in there, you're not sharing with your spouse. You need to be open with that. You need to, you need to share that openly and get that out and pray about it as well. In that aspect, go to bed every night, forgiving each other and bury the hatchet after every disagreement, avoid being negative about your spouse, turn curses into blessings, make lemonade from lemons I cannot tell you how every, sometimes when I go to church, I hear couples say something bad about their spouse. They say that they don't cook good enough. They don't do this and that. And I know life's hard. We nag and complain. My wife's done it to me. I've done it to my wife, but avoid negativity. Always say positive things and the good things about each other because the glass is always half full. And at the end of the day, all you have is your spouse and your family and don't take them for granted. Appreciate the little things and all contributions in the marital union. Cherish every moment. Enjoy and cherish your sex. This is even scriptural and we will discuss this more. Now, I am not saying that a married couple should have the, you know, blatantly, you know, sexual Olympic type sex all the time or whatever it is. What I'm saying is, and I, and I know this is an elephant in the room or whatever it is, but you need to know your partner's, your, excuse me, your spouse's sex. You need to understand what turns them on and what turns them off, both socially in the bedroom, outside the bedroom. You, you need to understand this. Because you need to grow closer to each other, not further apart. This is what prevents falling out of love with someone. If you love each other every day, you'll never stop loving that person. And 
You shouldn't try to change your spouse all the time. Romance is born out of differences as well as similarities. And it is the key to knowing those differences that make the stronger marital couple stronger than even as it is. But have fun with your sex. Enjoy your partner's sex. And make sure that it's the sex that, that you guys want. Have safe sex. And don't bully your spouse into having sex they don't want to have because they're not a rag doll. They're a human being as well. And neither spouse has the power to put their own, uh, to just put their, you know, their sexual, uh, uh, whatever. What's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's hard to, uh, bruteness, you know, whatever into, into that relationship as well. There needs to be a serenity of your sex life. There needs to be a coming in two with your sex life within marriage itself. It's it, it's a complex issue, and it varies from couple to couple, from culture to culture, from from ethnicity to ethnicity. It's it's a it's a vast topic in of itself, and uh, it's really something the couple should should explain with themselves. But pastoral counseling can be sought out with as well because. Let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen, if it weren't for, if it weren't for that, that gold ticket, me and you wouldn't be here right now. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's good to understand that both spiritually healthy and, and, uh, conjointly and, and maritally sound in that at all times. Now, another issue I want to discuss ever, ever people have asked me, well, brother Byron, what do you think about courthouse marriages? What do you think about just to the peace marrying someone? And I've offended people with my response with this, and I've also had people who have agreed with me on this. Now, let, let, let's recap for a minute. Even during the time when Christ was here on earth and after he ascended into heaven, during that time in the, in the early 30s, 40s A.D., Marriage was not only a covenant, I understand it was a civil institution. It was a civil institution in the Roman government. It was a civil institution in Babylonia, Assyria. Even, even when the Jews had their own kingdom, it was a civil institution with secular laws governing it and the state protected it as well. I understand that. It is also a civil institution today. I, I, I get that. It is easy to see why marriage has to have some legal entity involved with it. Because even in the United States, there are, I think there's over 3,000 uh, rights, privileges, and obligations that married people may enjoy if they are civil unionized or married in a civic sense. Now, there is no scripture that supports contractual marriage or civic marriage. There is no verse. I mean, there is a verse where Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. But we, but then you just said, well, Brother Byron, didn't you just tell me that marriage was a covenant, that it was an institution from God? I did. Well, if we render unto God what is God's, then we have to render marriage unto God because God founded marriage. It is his, his covenant. It is his ordinance. It is his, his well-being. It is his establishment that is honored and protected by New Testament Christians. Now, being that said, the legality of marriage and how it should be handled is this. I support privatization of marriage. This is how I would do it, and I strongly encourage state legislatures, if they listen to this video or anybody who listens to this video, to listen to me when I say this. Let the, leave the church alone and let them do their own thing, whether it be Baptist, you know, our churches, you know, Catholic churches, whatever. Let the church alone. And in our Western democracies, they have to be left alone to pursue that. And what they need to do is, if a couple weds spiritually and 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 procures a covenant with God between themselves, they should be able to go to the courthouse, put a stamp on that, and. Render that document the civil unionizing document that allows the marriage to have legal property, legal entities outside of the covenant of marriage. That's that's why then then that document can serve as the civil union document in and of itself, and it would allow the legal vicissitudes of marriage to persist without grave fallouts or the social order collapsing. 
and I believe this is what we need to do in and of itself. Uh, and, and you're just like, all right, well, can you give it, can you give an example of this? I said, yes, I can. Okay. Let's, let's look at, uh, a taste case, uh, a test case study. All right. In, in the Netherlands in the, uh, in the early 19th century, and I know I'm, I'm bragging about the Dutch right quick. Okay. They passed a law that's, that was called like the Onschlaf or something like that. It, I forget what it was called. It segregated civic and religious institutions because the reformed believers in the Netherlands, non-baptistic and otherwise, did not want the king to have a say over their their doings. And it was and it was similar to how it was in Virginia and Rhode Island in the early colonial days. They did something similar to this. They put a stamp on it and they allowed the covenant to be respected, but they also allowed the legal vicissitudes of marriage to be respected also in that aspect. Because I I understand it, it makes sense that, you know, if you file file taxes together, adopt kids, you know, that's something that the covenant can't really quote unquote, you know, hit out of the ballpark. So that explains why marriage has to be somewhat civic in and of itself. But it shouldn't hamper and go about that way. And then some of you might say, well, Brother Byron, why can't marriage be a fundamental civil right like the courts say they are? I get that. And the Supreme Court has said this before. Here's the problem with that. Well, what happens when a church decides they don't want to marry two dudes? You can't deny them their civil rights. It's the law. So if the government got and hampered on the church on following its own covenantal ordinantial doctrine, it would cease to be a church anymore because it would steal that institution from the church and render it into the hands of the state, which is a violation in the United States. That's a violation of the first amendment. So that can never, never take place. Now countries like Britain where the Anglican church is the state church. They have a problem with that. And other countries do too. They have state religion, but that's their problem. We're focusing on, on us in and of itself. And these two, these two institu and the civic nature of marriage, as well as the spiritual nature of marriage should be segregated in a healthy and meaningful way going on with that. But let's talk about other issues. Uh, people have asked me, well, Byron, brother Byron, what's your, what's your opinion over domestic partnerships or cohabitation? I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say that, uh, that a lot of a lot of couples have not lived together and shouldn't live together before they get married because a lot of people told me, well, brother Byron, what happens if you live together and you can't and your domestic habits clash and you divorce? That does happen sometimes. The only way I see out of that out of that issue coming to the fo to the foothold and being what that is. Uh, a chaperone could live with the couple to see if they mingle domestically and get along that way. Most people don't have domestic issue in the home. Some people do, some people, some people don't. It's just that varies from couple to couple and they, they should do that. But, uh, and I, and I know I'm going back in there. There is no verse in the Old Testament or the New Testament that forbids cohabitation. The only information I could come up with was in the Talmud. It prohibited in, in Jesus' eyes and the eyes of the rabbis before Christ established his new church and his new covenant in the New Testament. It bypassed the soul. It There has to be a sense of, of commitment and accountability in the marriage union and the soul cannot be bypassed. That's why at the root cohabitation is bad. You're not committing and you are not holding your spouse accountable because you haven't committed to that covenant. You haven't vowed into that covenant. That is why cohabitation may not necessarily be sinful, but it it's negative. It's an appearance of evil. I would say it's an appearance of evil in that aspect because it, it does something like that. Domestic partnership explains in of itself. Anything polyamorous is just bad. <laughs> Anything polygamous is bad. It is, it is evil, whatever it is, because the New Testament says one man and one woman. I have scriptural support for this. It is in 1 Corinthians. It is in 
Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 39, all those verses, if you just pull into there and read them, it supports uh, uh, the monogamous nature of marriage, the heterosexual nature of marriage, and that aspect, Romans chapter 1 explains that homosexual relationships are inherently sinful, that the covenant cannot be bonded in with that. All that is self-explanatory in of itself and really needs no further comment. But a lot of people have also asked me, how long should you be engaged? How long should you be betrothed? Me and my wife were engaged uh, <laughs> about two or three months and we knew, and we just knew in our hearts after we accepted counseling that we loved each other and we wanted to spend the rest of our lives with each other. And we also... Uh, we spent time with each other in each other's homes to make sure that we knew each other domestically and, and that our habits didn't clash or whatever. Because at the end of the day, you don't know anyone until you're living with them. It's that simple. People can pull the wool over your eyes like my dad always told me. You know, you go home, they go home. It's it's very different. When you live with someone, it's, it's, another, it's very different in and of itself. But pretty much everything I've discussed in there is sort of self-explanatory in and of itself. And just because you can live with someone before you're married doesn't mean you necessarily should do that. If you're single, making good money, uh, in that you should pursue Christ. And you should uh, flee incest, flee fornication, flee all those sexual sins, and, and, and don't go forward with that. And going on forward, uh, what does Scripture say about polygamy? I think I've already talked about that. Divorce, gayness, ster sterility, gender confusion, and intersex marriage. As stated before, marriage is between one man and one woman, and this has been the tendency of Jude Judeo-Christian wedlock since Christ's time in order to, perform, in order to provide for, another, for their spouse. And I know what people are saying. Well, Brother Byron, uh, what about King David? He had 18 wives, and Solomon had 700, King Josiah had two spouses. Let me make something perfectly clear. Polygamy was permitted in Old Testament times because in Jewish custom and tradition, it was allowed. Divorce was also allowed in that aspect too. Marriage was a hot button topic around Christ's time. There were many different schools of thought that the Jews were discussing in themselves. Some believe that the husband had ultimate power. He could divorce his wife for whatever reason and not give a care about her. There were certain Jews who believed that it should be a co-optimal thing or whatever. And some people believe that if the husband found disfavor or jealousy between whatever, that he could divorce his spouse for whatever reason in and of itself. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, Byron, why would a holy and just, merciful God allow things like divorce, intersex physiology, heter homosexuality, and sterility? Here's the reason why that is. It's us, church. It's sin. It is our depraved, depra excuse me, depraved nature that God allows these evil things to happen, these bad things to happen. And God can turn curses into blessings in and of itself. And just because something was allowed doesn't mean it was always permitted or that it was always good to happen. Monogamous marriage was the Jewish custom back then, even though in Christ's time it was very rare for that to happen. One man and one woman was the norm, and Paul solidified that in the Old Testament, and that's the way it is now. God allowed this in Old Testament times to procreate the human race, and it was his will and blessing for men who served him to have that honor and that privilege to do that. That does not mean that that women did not get jealous back then or whatever, and nor was it, but yet again, it was not sinful. It is just one of those things that it's just God's will, and it must be loved and accepted in that way. Just like God asked Abraham to, to, to kill his own son, and that wasn't fair, but he was going to do it. You know, sometimes loving God is hard. Sometimes loving God, and, and I think the long suffering of marriage is what, people struggle to consider and think about in and of itself. 
but I'm going off on a tangent anyway. The epistles celebrated celibacy. It's uh, singleness is celebrated and proper and holy. Celibacy is, or virginity, whatever you want to call it. Uh, spousal death and remaining widowed was uh, a contentment in, in New Testament times too. Uh, monogamic, endogamic, and heterosexual covenant marriage was the New Testament norm. That is not to say ex, exoga, uh, exogamy outside of one's culture, social class, ethnic background, linguistic background, other background is not sinful, but it should be carefully considered and pray, prayed over at all times. Let me give an example. I have a buddy in New France right now. He's Asian, but uh, he married a European woman and their marriage is i'm sure they may have had some issues in that but they discussed that they talked about it you know culturally speaking or whatever it is and they got through it through the lord's counsel through prayer through through immersing themselves in scripture and in prayer with god as they should in that that aspect but moving on uh the other the other element in the room as well well uh, what about divorce, Brother Byron? Let me make something perfectly clear. Malachi, uh, the book of Malachi, firmly claims that God hates divorce. Uh, he despises it. The, when the disciples went to Christ and asked him about that in the, in the New Testament, he goes, well, why did Moses allow us to do that? Because the human heart was hard. And because of that hardness of your heart, God allowed that to happen in and of itself. And I understand some couples... Uh, uh, they need to divorce their, their spouse. I get that. Some people are living in abuse right now. They're living terrible lives. They're living lives full of, full of hell in their lives. And, and they're just not, not going the way they should go. And their marriage is not spiritual and not pure in of itself. I would argue if, if not all marriages are equal, I wouldn't think all divorces are equal. I remember, <laughs> I remember one of my preachers telling me that one uh, one time when I was teaching Sunday school. He goes, well, Brother Byron, I don't think that divorce is equal with the same marriage is equal. That's not a scriptural thing. I know that's philosophical, but there's a lot of common sense with that. For example, the, the couple that falls out of love with each other, shouldn't they make that marriage work or talk about that or whatever it is? I mean... You should take the covenant seriously. If the couple is not taking the covenant seriously, then why do they not take divorce seriously? Why aren't they taking that seriously? And I, I guess I'm on my on my on my soapbox about that. But if if the ordinance is not respected in that, uh, you know, we, we need to prevent idolatry. You can worship your spouse spiritual neglect you could worship your marriage more than you worship god that's bad you could show favoritism and be carnally jealous of your spouse or other people that is that is marital sins that we don't talk about in this day and age that we need to avoid and, and follow through with that in and of itself altogether But divorce is only permitted for the following reasons. Extreme sexual immorality. If your spouse is addicted to pornography, if they won't get off the computer, if they won't get off their phone with it, if they're sleeping with someone else, there's no sexual compromise or having unhealthy sex for a prolonged nature of time. Spousal abandonment. Like, <laughs> let's say I decided to leave tomorrow and head for the Grand Canyon, baby, and never come back. Yeah, my wife has the right to divorce me. Absolutely. Because I abandoned her if I did that. If if my friends tell me, well, like I remember this gentleman came to me in confidence. And I'm not going to give his name, but I was counseling a man one time. And he's like, well, my wife just left me for someone else. And I said, divorce her. He goes, but I still love her. And I'm like, she didn't love you back. Don't put yourself through that. It's time to end it. You know, at the end of the day, you know, Christ gave his life for the church but he had to end his life. He couldn't keep dying. It had to end. Eventually, Christ had to leave the disciples and go to heaven. Some things have to end. You know, Philip left the Ethiopian prince to do his own thing at his ostrich when, God, when the Holy Spirit lifted him up and sent him there. You know, at, at some point or another, Moses had to hand the baton over 
to Joshua. You know, there, there are certain things that just come to an end that need to end. And spousal abandonment is one of those things. A third reason for divorce in order to be sp spiritually valid is extreme physical, emotional, or mental abuse of, of their own spouse or their children. Uh, if, if they're abusing the children, if they have a drug habit and they're not getting better, yeah, divorce them. If they're not uh, putting their own, if they're not sacrificing themselves, if the husband is not spiritually leading his spouse the way he should go and is and is crawling into the devil's abode of abuse, the wife has the right to divorce him or vice versa. If, if the wife is constantly nagging and abusing her spouse emotionally, it, it, if it's like stepping on eggshells, if it's toxic in that household, by all means, get, get out of it. Get out of it. And I know what you're saying. Well, Brother Byron, what if I have to face the music in heaven? Well, let me tell you something. I, I wonder if my parents will have to do that one day. And I know I'll... I'll sit and account for everything that, that my that my wife has done for me and I've done for her. And I hope that I, I've won her enough crowns. I've won her enough beauty, enough grace, that I've shown Jesus enough in her life to love me more than Jesus would love me, to get to that, that, that ever so tender, amazing love that Christ had at Calvary, that he could explain that in and of itself. I That is my prayer and daily hope. Just because a couple falls out of love or if they got married for shallow, carnal reasonings, you need to marry for the right reasons. I will end with this. You need to, to marry for the right reasons, not just for their sex, their money, their familial power, for revenge. And yes, people have got married for revenge. I know couples like that. Uh, I remember watching Rudy. We watch it every St. Patrick's Day and Rudy was seeing this girl you know, in the movie, you know, they're Catholic in there and that's all fine and dandy. Well, Rudy goes off to college to get his bachelor's degree, you know, and to play football over there. Well, he comes home for Christmas. His girlfriend is dating his brother. She wanted in that family. She wanted that money of that family, the prestige of that family. She was seeing the Rudigers for the wrong reason in that relationship. She wed for the wrong reasons. And, she may not have understood what marriage and relationships are all about. She may have thought it was a game and that's her business. But, and I know it's a movie, but it has a lot of real life examples with that. Uh, a couple should not marry for restitution to pay off someone or to money lauder. They should not marry to cover up some social or dirty issue or an unexpected pregnancy. It is okay to not marry someone if they're pregnant with your child. And I know that's harsh, but your children will love you more for not getting married if you told them, and I know this from personal from personal example and reason, I know this, if you chose not to get married, if you knew the relationship couldn't work just because, just because you decided to have a child together. Uh, my goal is in making this podcast that, uh, I wanted to sense, I wanted a spiritual, uh, real outlook of marriage. I want this postmodernism, this spirit, this casual hookup culture that we have, this non-romantic, non-chivalrous, uh, issue of marriage, this, uh, non-ladylike appearing of marriage. Like I want men to be men again and women to be women again in holy matrimony. And uh, lastly, I'll conclude, well, Byron, what about intersex people? Not everyone's born a man or a woman. So what about those people? You mentioned biological male and women at the beginning of the video. I did. Well, um, I will say this. If, if the intersex person feels dominantly male, then they should accept the male role. If the intersex female feels more, more, uh, more female in that aspect, they should, they should, they should wed too as well. As long as it conforms to the heterosexual paradigm, the monogamous nature of it, the exclusiveness of it, which means it's private and only going in and of itself in that aspect, that's, that's what they should do. And, uh, Let's see.
I guess I, I can close with some quotes. Um, Brother Grant and, and Britain had this to say about marriage. It is an, an insupportable sorrow when a woman hath forsaken all relations in the world to consort with her husband and then finds that his heart is not with her. This is called a treacherous dealing and reproved by the prophet Malachi. He that putteth his wife out of his affection dealeth no better than he that divorceth her. This one of love between husband and wife is a grievous iniquity, a treasonable impiety, hateful in the sight of God, and yet that is not which Satan prevails to, to ensnare men with to the provoking of the majesty of heaven against them, to the evil example of their families, and to the perdition of their own souls. God will be avenged on this generation for this iniquity. Jeremiah 5, 7, 8, 9. How shall I pardon thee, thee for this? Everyone nayeth after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? And another quote on marriage from Baptistic teaching is what Lord Gill had to say. Uh, he said in, in one of his books, it is commonly observed and pertinently enough that the woman was not made from the superior part of man, that she may not be thought to be above him and have power over him, nor from any inferior part as being below him and to be trampled on by him, but out of his side and from one of his ribs, that she might appear to be equal to him and from a part near his heart and under his arms to show that she should be affectionately loved by him and be always under his care and protection. And I really love how Lord Gill cared for Lady Gill. He, his wife got sick. He took time out of the pulpit to care for her. Same thing with Spurgeon. He took time out of his out of his ministry to care for her. Pastoral men love your wives. Men love your wives. Wives love your husbands. We need more love in this day and age, not not more hate in of itself. Let me see if I can find another quote. Uh, Sarah and Samuel Pierce. Here's some good ones. The occasion of my writing is a source of joy inexpressible to myself, a joy which I know you will participate. I am no longer a bachelor. Your amiable friend permitted me to call her my own yesterday. One dwelling now contains us both and Paul square contains that dwelling. Avoid any religious controversy with Mrs. Briggs. I fear she has more studied system than healed herself to the influence of truth. You, my love, I believe, have been better employed. I have been much afraid lest she, she should distress your mind. I have no under no apprehensions of her altering your sentiments. I believe you have been taught by them by the Holy Ghost who dwelleth in you, and that you will be kept therein by the power of God. But it, it will pain your mind to hear your Lord degraded and blood wherewith you were sanctified a, I count it an unholy thing. Last evening were my eyes delighted at the sight of a letter from my dear Sarah. I rejoice that you, as well as myself, find that absence diminishes not affection. For my part, I compare our present correspondence to a kind of courtship rendered sweeter than what usually bears that by that name by a certainty of success, not less than when I sought your hand in marriage. Now I, do I now court your heart, or doth the security of possessing you at all lessen my pleasure at the prospect of calling you my own when we meet again? And then towards the end of the letter, he added, Oh, our dear fireside, we shall sit down toe to toe and tete a tete again. Not a long time while I, I hope will elapse ere I rejoice that felicity. Hmm. People don't write that way anymore. Uh, I highly recommend Sarah and... Uh, what was her husband's name? Samuels, yes. Uh, Pierce's Marriage. Uh, they were, uh, it's a great book. Uh, if you want to read any of the early 17th century comments on marriage, uh, you can go ahead and do that as well. I may leave uh, descriptions in the uh, box below with that. I'll, I'll add the spiritual exegesis from this. But uh, if you have any other questions, just uh, shoot a comment below or uh, comment on my Instagram page. I'm going to make a post about this. But uh I love you all. God bless you so much. And um, I guess I'll end in a closing prayer. Uh, Father God, I thank you for revealing this knowledge to us, for your covenant of marriage, for your holiness of marriage. And I thank thee that you've answered me in my prayers. I thank you for my marriage, a great, holy, beautiful marriage that I love so much. I am so unworthy of this marriage, Lord, that I know that that you will give blessing and strength through that as we see the day through. Lord, may we enjoy this day in fellowship with as husband and wife. Lord, every, all things are strengthened and glory unto you 
Father God, Lord, I thank you for the elements of marriage. Lord, I thank you for its its grace and its and its mutability, as I've said before, Lord. I thank you for the holy writ over scripture, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you're a God that hates divorce. I thank you that you're a God that reconciles man and woman together, Lord. I thank you that you're a God that eschews evil and shines righteousness forevermore, Father God, for you are the righteousness of righteousness, Elroy. You are our lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I thank you so much for that. King Jesus, I just pray that you have your own way in my life and in any other life. And I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Well, that's all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, fellas, get to provide that wood and oil and that wine. I <laughs> uh, love you all. Peace out. Uh, have a good day. And uh, goodbye.